Here are three takeaways for how investors should interpret the job market and inflation stats. Hi, I'm Jeffrey Roach, Chief Economist for LPL Financial. And in this edition of the Econ Market Minute, I wanna share some insights on the shift that's happening in both the job market and inflation and what that means for markets in the economy. So first, payrolls are roughly 2 million below trend, even now. So had the shutdowns not occurred, the number of jobs in this country would most likely be roughly 2 million higher than where they are today. That would be in keeping with the pre-pandemic trends of 2018 and 2019. Now granted, the growth in payrolls has been pretty consistent despite tighter financial conditions. In June, for example, payroll employment rose by 209,000, a bit softer than expected and nowhere near the rate implied by other employment data, but still pretty good. Investors often focus on wage growth since many believe that wage growth is a driver for inflation. So let's look at that for a minute. In June, wage growth grew 0.4% from a month ago, indicating a fairly hot labor market. And I think what's happening here is businesses appear desperate to attract and retain workers. This actually could be a good thing for workers as firms seem inclined to hoard workers these days. Labor hoarding usually happens when firms don't want to lay off workers because business owners think the demand downturn could be short and they don't want to incur the searching costs to replace those people when businesses see that business activity pick back up. The bottom line here in this first takeaway is wage growth is strong, especially for blue collar workers, as businesses appear desperate to attract and retain those workers. The latest jobs report all but ensures the Fed will increase rates later this month. Wage growth was faster than expected and definitely too hot for central bankers trying to quell inflation. So second, markets can finally have something to celebrate with the deceleration in core inflation. Core inflation rose 0.2% in June, the smallest monthly increase since August 2021. I think investors will likely respond favorably to this latest report. Here are the highlights from the June Consumer Price Index. Consumer prices rose 0.2% in June, pushing the annual rate of inflation down to 3%, the lowest annual rate since March 2021. More importantly, as I mentioned earlier, inflation excluding food and energy, that's core inflation, rose 0.2% in June. And that was that smallest monthly gain in quite some time, mid-2021. The largest contributor to the monthly increase in prices was shelter costs, accounting for over 70% of the increase this month. Grocery prices were unchanged in June, providing a bit of reprieve for lower income households. However, prices at restaurants are still rising at a fast clip, indicating consumer demand is still strong for restaurant service. The overall theme here in recent months has been a stronger consumer demand for experiences over stuff. And we're seeing that play out in consumer pricing dynamics. The bottom line here in this takeaway is investors can see an encouraging trend developing in consumer prices. Overall, the deceleration in core prices will be happily received by investors. Yields on the two-year treasury note fell over 10 basis points on the news. This supports our view that bond yields will likely be lower by the end of the year. Third, the Federal Reserve can start prepping for the end of their rate hikes, finally. Inflation is easing. We're still waiting for the full impact from the Fed's aggressive rate hiking campaign. And firms are starting to tell us that hiring plans are slowing down. So when consumers use up their excess savings and the pace of hirings slow, we could see markets get a little bit of a growth scare as the economy downshifts. So what does this mean for you? Looking ahead, key areas for investors to watch include credit demand. Now, as of May, total consumer credit had the slowest increase since November 2020. Non-revolving credit, that's the credit used for purchases such as for automobiles, fell 1.3 billion. That was the first decline since April of 2020. 
The use of credit slowed as the cost of borrowing rose over the course of the Fed's tightening cycle. No surprise there. And I think it's fair to say that the auto sector is cooling amid a growing number of buyers underwater in car loans. Now, revolving credit outstanding, think credit cards, rose only 8.5 billion, a much slower pace than the previous two months. So with credit card rates now over 20% in May, that hit an all-time high since the data series began in 1972. So investors should closely watch the credit sector for a harbinger of weaker growth. Well, that's all for now. Continue to follow me and the LPL research team on social media and take care.